The journal was one of the dozen possessions that they had left behind. It lay open on a small table, a fountain pen, and a bottle of ink next to it. The ink was cobalt blue and made by Wilkins of London, according to the label. The journal itself had a dark leather cover and unlined vellum pages. Apart from the dust gathered on the exposed surfaces, there was little sign that it had been a hundred years since anyone had handled it. As I turned the pages, tentatively at first, scared that they might tear, I felt a shiver pass through me. The writing was neatly controlled. I was not an expert on how the human mind worked, but it struck me that this was the penmanship of an individual who was organized and rational. The name of the author was inscribed on the first page. John Benjamin Andrews. I wiped the sweat from my face and took in deep breaths. I was a respected academic and I held back from doing what I really wanted to do, which was to jump up and down and holler, yes. I looked back down at the name written in the journal and thought, after all this time, I'm so close. I took another deep breath and I began to read. We set sail from Southampton shortly after noon. The sky was clear and there was a brisk wind. I stood with my hands on the rail and I looked out to sea, smiling broadly. My colleagues were on either side of me. When I glanced around at them, their expressions mirrored my own. We were a small, enthusiastic band of adventurers, four in total. I was the leader of our group. I was almost 35. For many years, I had hardly set foot outside the grounds of the university, which had become the center of my life, while I rose to the position of professor of archaeology. Even the great war which had stolen the lives of so many men had passed me by, because of the injury to my leg suffered when I was still at school. A motor car had appeared out of nowhere while I was crossing the road, and I was so shocked by this metal beast, the first one I had ever seen that I was rooted to the spot. The car veered but still caught me and I spent eight long months in the hospital. The doctor saved my leg but pain had been my constant companion ever since. I would have never appeared as the hero in a novel or on a cinema screen, silently overcoming villains while the organist in the pit worked up a sweat. But I made up for my physical shortcomings with a fiery determination. The world of academia was cutthroat. If you were as ambitious as I, and as well as at devoting myself to research and tutoring my students, I had also become adept at the seedy art of politics. I formed friendships with the powerful, friendships that were empty of any affection and can be ended at the drop of a hat when it was time to change my loyalties. I said things that I did not believe and kept my silence on matters that I cared about. I did more on top of this, things that I will not write here, as I do not wish to incriminate myself. It was all part of the game, and I was a skilled player. Otherwise, the expedition would not have been funded, and I would have not been its leader, heading for a destination thousands of miles away from the familiar comforts of my life. This is a journey of three weeks. I have decided not to share the encounters that I made on board with people from different stations in life, the misery caused by the gut churning waves, or snippets of observation from the ports at which we had stopped on the way. There are other travelers on this ship on Grand Tours, whose memoirs will no doubt be packed with gossip and romance, dazzling sights and breathless descriptions. I leap forwards instead to our arrival. My first sensation when I had disembarked from the ship was how crowded the dock was. I had never seen so many people crowded into one place. And a storm of activity raged around me, pushing me this way and that. A porter carrying a crate barged me out of the way. I felt hands trying to grab a hold of me, and when I tried to brush them away with the stick that I used because of my damaged leg, I saw they belonged to children. They were reaching up to me, begging, I supposed. With their distended bellies and sunken cheeks, many were clearly starving. I looked up and away. I was not here to save the lost, and even if I had been there, there were far too many. 
I saw that they had gathered around my colleagues as well. Each had their own little swarm of urchins. Mitchell was a solid student who made up for his lack of flair with hard work. He was fair-skinned and suffering very badly from the effects of the sun. Jensen was a former soldier who worked as a groundsman at the university. I had brought him along because I assumed we would need brawn as well as brains on the expedition. The final member of our party was Taylor. He had been born into a mining family and, through a determination that I recognized, had become an undergraduate at the university. Eventually, we all made our way beyond the worst of the crowd at the dock and into the crowds pressed into the narrow streets, which were even worse. The stench of sweat and tobacco and food being cooked in stalls made me want to retch. I was incredibly relieved when I finally stepped through the doors of the hotel that we were booked into for our first night, and I found myself in an almost deserted lobby, a fan turned delicately above me, making no difference whatsoever to the heat. But still, it was a welcome sight. My leg was by this point burning with pain and I was desperate for a strong drink and a hot bath. Followed by my equally bedraggled colleagues, I signed the guest book. The concierge handed me a telegram. It was two days old and was from the head of my college. Carter given one last opportunity to make breakthrough, it read. Carnivon to extend and no more funds. This pleased me. Howard Carter's work was well known to me, but it seemed that his efforts continued to be fruitless and that his benefactor, Lord Carnarvon, had decided to withdraw support. It looked like a man who I regarded as a competitor was faltering, and as exhausted as I was, I found it hard to sleep that night. I was desperate to be on site and to begin the dig, and to succeed. I wrote that last sentence five days ago. Five hellish days. We have traveled by motor car and by pack horse and on foot. We had been feasted on by insects. Mitchell's already scarlet face swelled up alarmingly as a result. We had been set on by a pack of wild dogs. Even when Jensen began dispatching them with clinical accuracy that kept coming, driven by madness it seemed, from the foam frothing between their fangs. And every mile of the way, I've seen birds that gathered over carrion at the side of the trail that we followed. But we have made it. We have set up camp in the ruins of a building of indeterminate age, crudely assembled with stone blocks. My theory is that the blocks could date back to the time of the Great Construction, which took place on the site in a far distant age. The theories are all that I have. The rest is legend and mystery. It is written that on this site there arose the tomb of a great king. Even his name had been lost, but his was said to have been a cruel and bloodthirsty reign. A more romantic man than I might say that all traces of this despo had been wiped clean by this time. The down-to-earth explanation is that the materials of the tomb were steadily stripped away to be used elsewhere. My focus aim is to find if any part of the tomb remained intact. And for this, I must look beneath the ground. For my research, I speculate that the presence of an underground chamber is a possibility. After resting, we will begin our search. Our search. As I resume my record of this expedition, the hours that have passed since I wrote those words have been fascinating and troubling. We located what appeared to be an entrance to the underground chamber towards dusk. It was little more than a crack in the earth and we could have easily passed it by. But Taylor spotted it and waved us over. He and Jensen got down on their knees and began clawing away at the dirt and dust as soon as it became clear that this was an entrance. We peered into the darkness of what appeared to be a passageway. My heart was beating faster and faster and for a moment I almost forgot the pain in my leg. There was though one caveat to my excitement. A thick slab of rock lay by the entrance. It looked like it had been carved into a rectangular shape, but was now split into a number of pieces. The logical assumption was that this rock had once covered the entrance, and that it seemed that someone had come before us and broken into the chamber. Uh, tomb robbers, Mitchell muttered bitterly. I said nothing. It was dark by now and there was no way that we could carry on. 
We turned and began to head back to the shelter of our bays, all apart from Taylor. Wait, he said. Can you hear that? I paused and listened, but heard nothing. From their expressions, neither did Mitchell or Jensen. And Taylor scowled and got down on his knees and leant towards the opening. There, he exclaimed, and then turned to face us and asked, Can you hear them scream? Mitchell and Jensen rushed to where Taylor had knelt. I hobbled over as fast as I could. Jensen was shaking his head. I hear nothing, he said. It must have been your imagination. Still, when we descend, I will go first. He tapped the holster at his waist and added, in case of any unwelcome surprises. Mitchell looked sour-faced. We should reconsider, he began, but I cut him off. We continue, I told him. There are secrets here that I will know and nothing will stop me. For his part, Taylor wanted to linger, but I insisted a good night's rest was needed and so we all returned to our base. Where now we wait for first light, in the morning, we will descend into the tomb's underground chamber. These were the last words written in the journal. I closed it, the fold-up table on which it rested, the map curling at the edges, the small medicine box, and the other things the expedition had left behind that morning, when they had set off to the tomb were objects of historical interest in their own right. I turned to James, one of the post-grad students who I had invited to join me on this expedition, and I asked him to begin cataloging them. He looked up from his laptop and nodded. Allison, the other postgrad, asked brightly, What shall I do, Professor McGregor? Get ready to follow in the footsteps of the disappeared, I told her. Her smile wavered for a moment before she replied, Okay. For me, part of the enjoyment of teaching is injecting a little drama into my lectures. I like to combine technology with a compelling narrative to try and really bring the past to life. One of the last things I did before setting off on my expedition was put in a funding request for virtual reality headsets, which I wanted to use next term. It would be a fascinating new way to explore the past. Before then, I had an itch to scratch. I had first heard of John Benjamin Andrews when I was a postgrad student myself two decades ago. He was and remained the youngest professor in my university's history. A rising star of archaeology went missing 100 years ago, in the summer of 1922, while attempting to locate the tomb of a little-known ancient ruler. After reading about him in the official archives of the university, I sought out more information and came across articles from newspapers published at the time that would not have been out of place online today. They were pure trash talk. Andrews was accused of using the funds that he had been given for the expedition to start a new life abroad. He was supposedly about to lose his job because of his scandalous behavior. There was talk of opium use and illegitimate children. A photograph accompanying one article and showing Andrews smiling seriously into the camera dressed in his university robes was captioned, Is missing academic fleeing justice? Well, I did not believe a word of it. Throughout my career, I had had to deal with the fact that funding and positions were scarce and this created a competitive atmosphere that sometimes would spill over into backstabbing. That had no doubt also been the case in Andrew's day, but I couldn't believe that such a talented academic would resort to fraud and stage and not only their disappearance but that of three colleagues. My expedition aimed to restore the reputation of a fellow scholar in the field of archaeology. It was a personal venture during the summer break, and one that I was paying for with my own money. For their parts, any discoveries we made about the ancient ruler and his tomb would benefit James and Allison's studies, so everybody was happy. And while James cataloged the possessions and I asked Allison to come with me as I began the search for the entrance referenced in the journal. Our luck was I very much in. After only two hours, I found an opening in the ground. Fragments of a carved rock that could have once been used to cover it were still visible nearby. And the opening itself was just about wide enough for an adult to pass through. I asked Allison to run back to the old base and fetch James and some torches for each of us. 
While she was gone, I photographed the opening and marked its position on the map. And then while no one was there to watch, I breathed in and I squeezed myself through the opening. My middle-aged spread was not ideal in these circumstances, and I didn't want Allison and James to see me sweating and struggling, and then sighing with relief and letting my belly flop back out once I had made it. You okay down there, Professor? James called out from above me. I laughed and replied, Come on in, the darkness is lovely. With a lot more ease than I had managed, the two postgrads climbed down the entrance. Allison handed me a torch and I clicked it on. Fear gripped me as the beam of the torch revealed a hideous sight. We were in a narrow passageway. The ground was covered in bones. I picked out a jaw, a ribcage, the tangled bones of fingers as I moved my torch over the passageway, and then a skull peering sightlessly back at me. All were the remains of humans, there was no question. Behind me, Allison swore quietly. I lowered my torch for a moment. My hands were shaking and my mouth felt dry. I told myself to get a grip that I was a professional. I had excavated human remains before, but this felt very different. This felt like we had stumbled across a scene of some hideous tragedy or act of barbaric cruelty. I knew we should go back to regroup and return when we could properly document the remnants which lay before us. But my mind was racing. Was this the site which Andrews and his three colleagues saw a century ago? How did they react? Did they venture along the passageway and if they did, what did they find? I had to know. I shuffled around in the constricted space to face Allison and James. I am going to go on, I told them. I think you two should go back. No way, James replied. Yeah, Professor, Allison added, this is awesome. The youthful enthusiasm of their reaction brought a subdued smile to my face. Fine, I said. We go on together, but be careful. They both gave me the thumbs up and we started to move forward. It was impossible not to step on bone and I walked as lightly as I could to try and not break anything. The passageway was widening and still the procession of bones lay all around us. There must have been these skeletal remains of hundreds of people in there, all crammed together. As the passageway continued to widen, it also began to slope steeply downwards and I used one hand placed against the side to steady myself. A few minutes later, I was turning my torch to get a better look and had an almost complete skeleton when I should have been concentrating where I was going. It was like a mathematical equation. Dark passageway plus distracted professor plus steep slope equals a distracted professor falling over and tumbling down. I landed in a heap and I grabbed my chest. The fall had winded me and left me disoriented. My torch had fallen by my side and I picked it up and began to look around. I was in a rectangular chamber which stretched further than I could make out. Bones continued to cover the ground that I could see, and there was no signs of James or Allison. Hey, you guys, I shouted. Where are you? No answer. The only sound was my ragged breathing. And then Allison screamed. She sounded close and terrified. I shot to my feet and yelled out, what's wrong? Silence returned to the chamber. Allison, I tried again, and then James. Neither responded. I began to feel sick. I had brought them to this place. If anything had happened to them, I would never forgive myself. I began to scramble back up the slope, not caring now that I was disturbing the bones. They cracked underfoot and I desperately tried to make my way back. I fell again, punched the ground in frustration and was revving myself up to try again when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I span around, lifted my torch. What the? I exhaled. A man stood, exposed in the torchlight. He was pale and painfully emaciated. I could make out the sharp lines of his bones beneath his skin. That looked as if I had almost faded away to nothing. A smile flickered across his face. Welcome, he said. His voice was hoarse, a desiccated whisper in the bone-strewn chamber.
I stood open mouth, shock piling into shock because now I had recognized him. Andrews, I said, Professor Andrews. Even though he was grotesquely changed, I could still recognize the man whose photograph I had seen in a hundred year old news article. Ah, uh, he said quietly. The words sounded more like a death rattle than an exclamation of pleasure. Through his expression, he clearly was pleased that I had recognized him. His slight smile had become a grin and I saw that his teeth were decaying shards. Indeed, he said, I am he. I fought to understand whatever mystery had led to his disappearance. Andrew surely would have died many years ago. But how, I asked, how are you alive? His ravaged face took on a serious expression. I can explain, he said, but to do this, I need to tell the story of another man. This man was born a slave many thousands of years ago, and as a slave he had no name. To his master he was nothing. He was there merely to work and to serve. He grew up in the spreading shadow of the great tomb as it rose high above the slave's encampment. The dust thrown up by this construction lined his mouth and half blinded him. He scrabbled to feed on grain thrown out at the end of the day by the soldiers who kept order. And all the while the tomb soared as more and more blocks were added to its majesty. He grew as well all senior when dust cake skin and sleeping in fits and starts and then being woken to work again to build the tomb day after day. He was one of thousands of slaves condemned to live this way. Some didn't survive and their bodies were left where they fell. You would not mourn an ant, so why fret over a slave? This is how their master felt the great king, whose tomb they were preparing. Unlike his slaves, when he died, an entire nation was forced to weep at spear-pointed necessary. A special fate was reserved for the slaves. They were lined up and marched into the tomb and left in the vast chamber below their master's resting place. And when the tomb was closed, they were sealed in with the dead king. Confusion rippled through the slaves at first as they stood pressed together in the darkness. And then fear and panic possessed them as they realized they were trapped. They began to struggle to try and escape but the tomb that had become their prison did not yield. But still, they struggled, they fought, they scrambled one over the other. The weaker were crushed underfoot, the stronger killed each other with their bare hands. Soon, hunger and thirst ravaged those still left alive. One man among them decided on a desperate course of action to try and stave off the pain of starvation. He could think of no other way. He knelt over the body of another slave and he began to eat. And this man, the slave who was born nameless in the rising shadow of the tomb, had survived. I had listened breathlessly as Andrews had shared this tale. A storm of questions span around me and I asked, How do you know this? Did the man finally escape? And you found a written record of his ordeal. Andrews shook his head. No, he said. He stayed within the tomb where he remains to this day. His gaze had drifted past me to something behind me. With a mounting sense of dread, I turned around slowly to see. A creature from a nightmare. A creature from which the flesh had withered away, leaving slivers of it hanging off bone. A creature which stooped and dragged the gristle-lined bones off its feet across the chamber floor as it made its way slowly towards us. My stomach cramped and I came close to vomiting. What is it? I asked, struggling not to even speak. The slave, the man, Andrews replied. Before he bit down on the still warm flesh of his fellow slave, he begged the spirit of the dead king for mercy. He told the king that if he survived because of this abhorrent act, he would never leave. He would be his servant for all of eternity. Andrews reached out and took the hand of the creature in his own. Looking into the shadows, that were all that was left of the creature's eyes, and then continued. I do not understand the forces at play here, but they are real. He survived. He lived off the bodies of the other slaves as the ages passed. The tomb itself was being dismantled by ignorant people who wanted to use its dirty blocks elsewhere. So he retreated further and further into its depths, always feeding and always living on.
And when he had stripped the flesh from the last of the slaves that had been trapped with him, he fed on those fools that broke into the tomb hoping to steal its treasures. It was their screams, the screams of unwitting tomb robbers that my unfortunate colleague Taylor heard that night. When on the following morning we ventured down into the underground chamber of the tomb, I became separated from the others slowed by my damaged leg. I was lost and scared when many hours later, I stumbled across the bodies of Taylor, Jensen, and Mitchell. They were not alone. Hugh was standing over them, diminished by the long periods where he had no bodies on which to feed but still magnificent. And he told me that I did not have to share their fate. He gave me a choice, the same choice that I'm giving you. Open your heart to an ancient secret and become a companion. Linger here in the eternal darkness. Join me. Join us. His invitation hanging in the air between us, Andrews, affixed me with his gaze. Join us, he said again. Join us, the creature echoed. As it spoke, Andrews moved away into the darkness and returned a moment later, dragging two prone forms behind him. I began to cry. It was James and Allison, their throats gashed open and blood lay like a scarlet shroud over their bodies. Andrews dropped them on the ground, looked up at me and said, Feed on them as I fed on Taylor, Jensen, and Mitchell. Eat and join us. Afterwards, while I sat slumped on the ground, nauseated and feverish with a self-disguised, they looked at me contently, Andrews and the creature, and then they closed their eyes and went to sleep. They thought that the bargain was sealed and that they had a new companion, but they were wrong. I had not been seduced by their foul offer. As silently as I could, I crawled away and managed to find my way back to the entrance. I thought many times that I was lost and would never make it out of there, and that they would awake and drag me back down into the pit of dark depravity. Eventually though, I made it. I emerged out into the night, the desert vast and empty around me, and I told myself over and over again that I did what I did to survive. But as I stumbled away, I knew no matter how far I fled, I would never escape the memory of what I had done, that the taste of human flesh would be with me always.